Guys, are we live? Is this working? <laughs> Is this working? Hello. You know, I was quite nervous to do this because I have never done um, a YouTube live before. I've only done Instagram lives before. So if you're watching this, obviously it's going to take a few, it's going to take a while for um, people to join. But if you're watching this, can you let me know if the um, camera is looking okay? Because I'm just using the webcam. Height of sophistication here. Uh, so just let me know if the um, internet connection is okay. And also let me know where where you're, you're hailing from. Hi, Sana. You know, Sana is making vegan pasta and I'm really excited to see how her pasta turns out. I feel like we're having a book tube cook-off, Sana. We're gonna <laughs> have to compare results. Um, oh, great, the camera's looking great. Yay, hello. Okay, so we've got people from Russia. We've got people in Stockholm. Um, you're also making Vina, v, Vina, vegan pasta, Marie. That is very cool. Hello from York, Argentina. Amazing. Okay. All right. Amazing. You know, I had said that this was going to be a cozy cook-along. And then didn't another heat wave come along and it doesn't feel like awesome at all? So um, anyway, we're going to make some pasta. Um, and if you guys are cooking, that's amazing. And if you're not, and you're just here to, um, judge my pasta making, that is also fine. Um, so I thought there is going to be one point where we have to let the pasta sit for half an hour. So during that time, we can make a cup of tea and have, um, a bit of a Q and A. Um, and I know that some of you are not making pasta and are just making the sauce, which is also, of course, absolutely fine. So I don't know how long we should wait to let people get here because if people are cooking, I don't want people to, um, it is live, it is live, Angela, the pressure. Um, I don't want people to miss. So I feel like I should make, wait maybe a couple more minutes just so that everybody who is cooking, you know, gets here in time. So, well, maybe, what I'll do is I'll just go over all of the ingredients that we're going to need. Um, and that will take a couple of minutes and then we can start. So firstly, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be making the pasta. Um, and for that, you will need this. I know I've shown these on my channel before, but they are one of the greatest pleasures of my life. These are OXO Good Grips, not spawned, not gifted. And I love the way that they open and close. It's so satisfying. And yes, I did use um, my label maker because I'm a 33 year old lady and that's the kind of thing that excites me. So we're gonna need 310 grams of plain flour, which is two and a half cups, um, if that's a measurement that you use instead. We are gonna need four eggs. We are gonna need a tablespoon of olive oil. And then we are going to need about, I think it's about a teaspoon of salt, but I just eyeball it. So that's what we need for the pasta, which is what we're going to do first. So we're going to assemble the pasta um, and then we're going to let it rest for a little bit. And while it's resting, we are going to make the pasta sauce. So I'll just grab the ingredients that we're going to need for that. Bring them over from where I had already prepared them in advance. Okay. So for the pasta sauce, and this makes enough for between three and four people, so you can upscale it if you want to. So you're going to need two aubergines um, or eggplants. You are going to need some dried oregano, some dried chili, chili leaves, some olive oil, some salt and pepper, some garlic, some tomato puree, and 600 grams of passata um, and then you may need a little bit of a white wine vinegar and you may need a little bit of sugar you're gonna taste it and then decide what your sauce will need um okay Anna says I'm on keto so I'm not joining in on the cooking but I've got snacks and a drink that sounds great you you are here in spirit all of you are here in spirit all right let me put these back and then we can start on the pasta making I did think 
about, sorry, I know the light's changing as I move. I did consider um, setting up like a proper camera and feeding it into my computer and all of that. But this is just a really casual thing between, between us, like a really friendly, casual thing. So I just kind of want to keep it old school. Um, so that's why you were propped up on a few cookery books and it's just the webcam on my camera. Right, so let's make pasta, let's make pasta. Let me tilt this down so that you can see, you can see the surface. So make sure, firstly, before we do anything, hi, make sure that your surface is really, really clean. Um, I cleaned mine before I switched this on, but we're gonna be rolling out, well, not rolling out the pasta, but kneading the pasta on here. So make sure this is super, super clean. And I just realized that I have um, blue nail varnish on, which I'm sure would be not allowed in a professional kitchen. And is it Monica and friends that she loses like a blue false nail in a lasagna? So let's try not do, not to do that today. All right, so firstly, get your scales and we are gonna measure 310 grams or two and a half cups of plain flour. And you don't need to sieve it, don't worry about that. Okay, I have got 316, so let me grab a spoon. I probably don't need to take um, the six grams out because this is not baking and we are gonna add quite a bit more flour to the pasta as we go because we need to dry it out. But just to begin with, I wanna try and be accurate and then we can improvise later. That's the only measuring that you're gonna to need to do. Um, okay, right. So you wanna, actually let me, let's add the salt in here first. So about a teaspoon of salt, but as I said, I just eyeball it. So you do you. Cool. And then stir that together. And then once you stir it together, you are gonna tip it out onto the surface. There we go. Okay, now what you want to do with the flour once it's on the surface is you kind of want to make it into a little volcano, okay? So you're gonna put a little hole in the middle and you want the sides to be high around that because we're gonna put our eggs inside here and they will escape a little bit, which is not a problem, but you want the majority of the eggs to stay in there. Otherwise it's gonna get messy. I think this bit is really fun. And I think that this is one of the intimidating things about making pasta is that it looks um, like you can't really mess up, otherwise it would be a disaster. And I don't really think that's true. So long as the egg doesn't go onto the floor, you're gonna be fine. You can pull it all back together. So once you've made your little flower, volca flower volcano, you are going to put into that, in the center, one tablespoon of olive oil. And again, I am eyeballing that. So that seems right. There we go. And then, we are gonna do the fun bit. We're gonna crack our eggs into the center of here. Now, let me bring my bowl back to crack them on the edge of. Now, this is where it could get messy, but as I said, it's okay. So one, there's one. Two. It's already quite full. As you can see, it doesn't really contain four eggs. You may need to push the sides up a little bit, but don't let the flour go in because we're gonna mix it before we need. Three. 
See, it's trickling. It's trickling. That's okay. That's okay. And four, which I'm going to do really quickly because otherwise we are going to be in a bit of a mess here. Come back, egg. Come back. This is why the surface needed to be cleaned. And I told you it was going to get messy. All right, there we go. Right, it's sticking. Now you need to grab a fork. And you need to beat the eggs in the middle. So you're breaking up the yolks, okay? So you're just breaking them up like this. And then once you have broken up the eggs, start to bring the flour into the middle. And then you might find it easier to get rid of the um, fork and just start kneading. Now, this is so messy, but I promise it comes together. You're just going to have to trust me, all right? It feels really <laughs> weird, <laughs> um, but I promise it works out. Okay. I would ask you to type and tell me how this is going for you, but I have a feeling that your hands are gonna be full, okay? So I understand that you can't <laughs> type right now because I certainly couldn't. Okay, you see it's all coming together a bit. It's really sticky and we want it to be like that at the moment. And then as I said, we'll add more flour later. I think the weirdest thing that I've needed, because um, when I started doing cooking and baking, which really was a bit like during lockdown, I didn't bake so much before that. I did a lot of like um, savory cooking, but I really started to do baking during lockdown. Um, the weirdest thing, yeah, sorry, what I'm saying is, I started doing bread, which is quite dry when you need it, and that feels fine. But then I started to do more pastry stuff, see, coming together. And I did um, cinnamon rolls, and it's such a strange feeling because the dough is so sticky and you can't add flour to it because then it will dry out the mixture. So you're literally kneading stuff that's just sticking to everything. It's like kneading slime and this is not as bad as that um so we're just going to need this so push down with your wrists you can punch as well but that hurts my hands so um i just press into it with my wrists so we're going to do this for a couple of minutes oh hello amy you said i'm so glad you're showing us this because if it was just me trying it and i got to this point i think i'd messed up and get stressed see yeah see you haven't messed up you rectify it and it's absolutely fine I mean I'm sure there are chefs out there who make it look really easy and don't let the eggs slide anywhere but this is just real life this is just me in my kitchen and I mess up all the time in fact one of the reasons I was slightly nervous to do She's getting stickier. Yours might be getting stickier too. Um, one of the reasons I was slightly nervous to do this was because the only time that I've done a live cook-along was when I did it with Lauren and Jean. And um, Lauren made cookies um, and I said I was going to make scones. Um, and I got too preoccupied with chatting to them that's my excuse, <laughs> that I missed out something. Was it an egg or it was milk? It was something liquidy so that when I put it in the oven, can you see it's really sticking now? When I put it in the oven, it came out so crumbly and I couldn't save it. Um, and the only thing that I could do, I guess I did save it, but they didn't end up being scones. I crumbled them up and I turned it into the topping for a fruit crumble instead because it was just <laughs> no way those scones were gonna be nice to eat. Um, so as you can see, it's really sticky here, which is absolutely fine for now. I think you can get like fancy um, pastry spatulas for really wet dough so that you can scrape them off the countertop. But I just have uh, a regular spatula, which I will use to pick it up in a second and put it into a bowl. But for now, I'm just gonna 
um, keep needing, even though it's, this is what I mean about it feeling like counterintuitive because you want to add flour to it, but um, we're going to do that a bit later. We're going to do it a bit later. Okay. It's a bit of a workout, I think. At least I like to think that. Not getting much of a workout in elsewhere. So this can be my workout. So yeah, what you, I'm gonna do this now and you might want to do this, depending on how your dough is feeling. <laughs> Ask your dough what its emotions are. Um, I am gonna use a spatula. You could also just use a regular knife. But you know, be careful. Um, I'm just gonna scrape this off the um, surface. There we go. And I am gonna add a tiny bit more flour. And then knead again, and this should make it a bit drier and a bit less strange to work with. Because the thing with pasta, later, after we've let it rest and we turn it into, I don't know, it's not spaghetti, because spaghetti is um, really, really thin. So I don't know if it's more like linguine. Let's say it's linguine. That sounds about right. Um, is that before you cook it, you have to make sure that it's really dry. Um, I guess that it uh, doesn't stick to each other. You don't want to end up with like a rat's tail of pasta in this lump that you can't disentangle because that is certainly not tasty to eat. Um, or at least I imagine it's not tasty to eat and I wouldn't recommend it. So as you see, it's kind of soaked up as much flour as it needs to now. And it's much more like dough and uh, not crazy. Marie, what are you doing? Um, my dough is feeling some imposter syndrome as it's vegan, but I'm reassured, <laughs> I reassured it that it would be okay. If you can type, because I know you've probably got your hands full, what recipe are you using for your vegan pasta because I think Sana said she was using one of those vegan eggs and um she was also just adding lots more olive oil so what are you doing with yours uh Katarina how do you know I mean you can't I don't think you can overdo it with this because it doesn't have yeast in it so you don't have to worry about killing it I should have timed when I started but we're going to stop in a second um you do it for like about five minutes it's probably been about five minutes yeah if your dough is really dry that's okay Caitlin that's all right that's fine you can add a little bit of um oh no egg replacement for you Sana you're just using olive oil a half semi and a half normal yes you have so much stuck to your hands I know I know um, what you can do with that, if you've got loads stuck to your hands, which I have a bit stuck to my hands, but not much, you can put some olive oil, put a tiny, not loads, put like a, a, a glug of olive oil on your hands and then knead your hands into the dough and that will make the dough come off onto, the dough on your hands come off onto the actual ball of dough, okay? Um, so that's fine. All right, let's stop. This is the dough. And yeah, I've got loads of stuff all over my hands, which I'm gonna wash off in a second. And um, so grab a bowl and put your dough in it like that. And we're just gonna put it to one side and we're gonna um, leave it to sit. If your dough is still really sticky, that's okay. Cause you can flour it more when we come back to it. I've done it both ways where I've added more flour at this point to make it a bit drier. And I've done it in the second part where I've added more flour to make it dry then. So don't worry, you can fix it later if it's still really sticky right now. That is absolutely not a problem. Um, so put it in a bowl and put it to one side. If you have cling film, let me tip it up, sorry, so that I'm not just a, a mouth talking at you. And um, if you have cling film, you can wrap this in cling film. I don't have cling film, so I'm not gonna do that. And um, I've never had a problem just leaving it to rest like open like this, that's absolutely fine. I think one of the reasons that you cover, um, I say this like I'm an expert and I'm not, I think one of the reasons that you cover um, 
breads and stuff is to stop them drying out. As I said, with pasta, you need it to be a bit dry later down the line anyway. So that's absolutely fine. So given that we're probably all really sticky right now, <laughs> um, let's wash our hands and clean our work surfaces and then we can start making the pasta sauce. So let's go do that. I, you can't, can you see I am covered, look at this, in flour. I should have worn an apron. Right, let's clean up and get things tidy. If you have flour on your counter, um, I would recommend, sorry, this is a basic tip. So I've done this before and it's really annoying if you don't do it, like for yourself, it's really annoying. I'd recommend getting off all the flour that you possibly can with a piece of like kitchen towel before putting water on here. Otherwise you're gonna make a paste and it's gonna be really hard <laughs> to clean. Um, and you'll make extra work for yourself. So scrape off all of the flour first. Greg, did you try the oil and is that what's working? I hope that your hands are less, you know, covered in a, what would we call it? Like gunk, pasta gunk? That doesn't sound appetizing. Gosh, it's satisfying. Why is cleaning so satisfying? All right. How's everybody doing? Oh, your dough feels good. I'm glad, I am so glad. It's so hard to, I guess, because I can't see your dough or what you're doing to kind of say, yes, you're doing it right. But um, uh, that's fine. Uh, Cindy says, we're fostering kittens and they are after this dough with determination. I want pictures of that, otherwise I'm gonna say it's not happening. I do believe you, I just want the pictures. You sent me a picture of your dough, Sana sent me a picture. Should we look at it? Let's grab my phone. Um, okay. Sana has sent me, have a look guys, this is Sana's dough. Very nice, very nice. Dry dough, don't worry Caitlin, we'll, we'll bring that back to life, don't you worry. All right, are we good? Are we, are we happy to start making pasta sauce now? Um, I'm going to assume that you guys are kind of kind of with me. So, um, firstly, what we need to do is to wash our eggplants. Grab a chopping board and um, a knife as well. I always want to say it like that meme: a knife. Um, 
<laughs> I'm glad that I was there to talk you through the sticky dough as well. <laughs> okay, right. Wash your own jeans. Wash your aubergines, and that's not a euphemism. And grab a chopping board. Okay, and chopping board. I don't know why when I am cooking, I feel the need to sing the names of stuff. Sorry. All right. So here we are with our chopping board and our aubergines. Now we're gonna do something that is a little bit strange with aubergines because normally if you're using, using them for a curry, you would cut them into chunks because inside there, well, I'll show you actually. I just, um, okay. So inside, aubergines are really foamy, which I'm sure you knew, but I'm just explaining what we're doing. Uh, normally you would just cut these into chunks and you would roast them and you would put them in a curry or you would do whatever. Today, we're only using the skin of the aubergine. Now, you, if you want to, you don't have to, you can just throw away the insides. You can keep the insides and then use them to make baba ganoush or something, um, which I think I may do. I will at least put them to one side so I've got the option. Um, so what we're gonna do is, so firstly, chop an aubergine in half, and then we're gonna chop it into quarters, like this, like ways. So you've got pieces that look like this. And then you are very carefully, because I do not want any of you to hurt yourselves. Let me do it this way so you can see. You're gonna put your knife here. Um, now obviously you're gonna take off some of the foam bits as well. You're not gonna just get the skin, but you're gonna um, slice it as thinly as you possibly can. It's like you're gutting the aubergine. So can you see you're going around and you're tracing the shape of it. Oh, hang on, there we go. Two get this so you just have very thin and then if you've got a bit of um, foam still in the middle you can just scrape that out with the knife afterwards so yeah it's all right if you've got some foam it's just it tastes in to me it tastes as I can't get words out it tastes the best when it's as thin as you can get it so it looks like this okay and you're going to do that with each of the quarters of each of the two aubergines and you get into a rhythm with it so don't worry make sure you keep your fingers away from the end of the knife you don't want to end up with fewer fingers she says <laughs> Let me get a bowl for these. Okay, that's two done. Easiest to cut from the pointy end rather than starting here. You're doing a beetroot sauce, kid, and that sounds interesting. I have to say, I'm not a huge fan of aubergines either, but it's the foamy bit that I don't love, I think. I think it's a texture thing rather than the taste. Um, so I really like this dish, but I don't love a lot of um, other aubergine things. Okay, three. Can you hear that 
noise. I swear, all of our neighbours are doing um, like renovation work at the moment. Okay, so there's the four, and then we're going to do the second one as well. Sorry, I realise I'm not talking much at this point, but I feel like this needs a lot of concentration. So I will stop and talk in a second. One more. What's Angela saying? Angela says, my dad always cuts them like you then gives them an egg wash, then turns them, oh, turns them in flour and then fries them. Oh my God, that's like, oh, what's it called? It's like tempura. That sounds awesome. Yeah, crispy aubergine skin is where it's at. Which is why we're cutting them really thin because it's the skins that go crispy when you cook them, they're not gonna go super, super crispy, but um, the foam obviously doesn't. And it's that texture that you want. So that's why we're cutting them like this, as opposed to just having big chunks of aubergine. All right, I'm gonna put these to one side for later. Okay. So we have our eight slices of aubergine and we are going to cut them in half this way and then we are going to cut each of these sections into long thin strips like this. So they end up, let me show you, I'll hold them up. So they end up looking like this. So they're half the length of one, and then they're really thin. Kind of like French fries, I guess. That's kind of what you're cutting them into. And you do that with all eight. For those of you who aren't cooking today, what are you reading at the moment? Tell me what you're reading, because I would like to know. And anyone who is cooking and is able to pause and type, you can also tell me that as well. I would like to know what people are reading. At the moment, I am reading The Particular Sadness of Lemon Cake by Amy Bender. Um, I'm not sure what I think about it yet. Um, if you saw my... Um, video just before the start of the month I said I'm trying to make my way through the first shelf of my bookcase I think it was about 
it's about 21 books, I think, that I would need to read in order to complete the shelf. So I don't think I'm going to complete it because what are we? We're on the 20th and I still have a few to read. But it has been really good to get through books that have been sitting there for so long. You know, the kind of books that you've put off reading, but you have no idea why you've put off reading them. And the Amy Bender is one of them. I think maybe... I have more of an idea of why I haven't read that one than some of the others on that shelf. I read another novel of hers, which I didn't love. And I bought a few of her books after having loved her short stories. So I think, think, though I don't want to speak too soon on the novel I'm currently reading because I'm only about 60 pages in. I think I prefer her short stories to her novels. Um, but we shall see. Okay. Um, you are reading... Oh. A middle grade book, Priory of the Orange Tree, um, Lost History of Dreams. I haven't heard of that one. I've heard very good things about The Cutter Warrior by Nadia Corafor. I haven't read any of her books. Finishing the Bass Rock, oh, still my favorite book of the year, I think. Day of the Triffids. I was worried about the Day of the Triffids. My spider plants are getting out of control. I'm worried that they're going to murder me in my sleep. <laughs> I think Virginia Woolf's writing is it's very Marmite and it's also the kind of writing that I really have to be in the mood for and it's the kind of writing that I can appreciate but not necessarily love in the moment. Um, Girl, Woman, Other is so good. If your skins are a bit thick, should we shave some of the foam off? I did when I was doing it, yes. Um, yes, I would do that, Greg. Um, you don't have to, but as I said, they are the nicest when they're thin. So mine are about that thick. So they're not nothing. Um, but yeah, they look like this. Um, okay, so I'm going to push that to the edge of my chopping board. Um, and we need to chop four cloves of garlic or more if you would like to because garlic is amazing. So let's chop cloves. Look at this beast. Look at that. That pleases me a lot. Okay, right. Break into this. There we go. Oh, I might do five because these are quite small. Um, two. That one is tiny, for instance. Three, four, five. Peeling garlic cloves is one of my least favorite things to do. So a tip, get a knife. You know, um, not that I particularly want to reference Harry Potter right now, but unfortunately a lot of my references in my head are tied up into that. There's that scene when Harry's reading the Half-Blood Prince's diary and um, it says to crush the pods to get the juice out and everyone else is trying to squeeze them and it's not working. That's what we're gonna do with the garlic. We're gonna crush it. So if you get the clove, get a knife, put your head on top of it and then crush. And then the, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> Covering comes off straight away and it's really easy. So again, it just comes away so satisfying don't need to try and pick the peel off and end up with garlic under all of your nails. I 
And Ellie said, I wish you could smell this right now, but if you're cooking it, you can. All right. So, um, keep your uh, garlic separate from your aubergine because you're going to be adding them to the pan at different times. So try not to let them, you know, get in, you know, make friends with each other. Don't let them make friends. Keep them separate. Don't let them sit together. I'm going to cut off the ends. And then, yeah. Cut them up. Ooh, come back. So there is my garlic all chopped up. You love garlic so much. I'm so glad that you love garlic so much. I love garlic so much too. Your garlic just went flying. No, tame that garlic. Tame it. All right, so make a little pile with your garlic when you're done. And then the final thing, actually, before we move on to something else, I'm just gonna get rid of this garlic here. Put it in my compost. How are we getting on? Um, oh, I see. Yeah, I think if you're not a native speaker and you're reading Virginia Woolf, I can imagine that that is hard because I find her difficult sometimes. Um, I think her quoting this pleases me a lot, but I can't remember what I said about that. I don't know what I said. Was it the garlic? Was it how big the garlic was? Okay, finally, the last thing that we need to chop is the basil. So my basil, where is it? It's over here. my little basil plant and um, so how much should I say I, I think I said a handful didn't I of basil so a handful of basil I'm just going to grab a few stalks from this There we go. Oh, it's looking quite sad now. Sorry, Basil. Get rid of this soil. Don't need soil. That's not good. Right. And then you want to separate the leaves from the stalks and put the leaves to one side for later. And then once you have ripped those leaves off, you want to cut, oh, split those into the wrong place. Come back here, stalk, there we go. You want to chop up the stalks finely. 
chopping board's getting a bit full now. And as I said, we're going to be using these leaves later. So put them safely to one side. I'm going to pop these. In a glass. There we go. Okay, so what you should have on your chopping board, you should have um, aubergine all chopped up, you should have four or five cloves of garlic or have many you want. And you should have the chopped up basil stems as well. How's everyone doing? Let me know how you're getting on because I don't know, I don't want to go too fast for everybody. Um, you said, I would love it if you could cook dinner for all your book two friends one day, we'll do the dishes. I, would have, I have done cooking videos where I've cooked, I think I've done Christmas dinner for um, Lauren and Jean for the past couple of years. Um, and I have done a pizza video, I think, with Jean before. There have been a few cooking videos. Obviously, I can't cook for everybody in the house at the moment, sadly. Um, you're, still on the, <laughs> you're still on the eggplant skins. Okay, Greg. All right. Keep going. I believe in you. I believe in you. Um, my husband learned English as his third language and finds an audio book with the physical book, physical book helps him with the denser English language text he's reading for his projects. That sounds like a really good way um, to do that. Oh, I love that. I love how we're all getting behind Greg. Go, Greg. Go, Greg. Okay. So, Greg, uh, you're still talking machines as well. All right. Okay. Let me tell, let me give it five minutes. Um, I'll let you guys um, who need a bit of time to catch up, catch up um, before we start cooking. Um, so I think I'll make myself a cup of tea. If anyone else would like to make themselves a cup of tea, you do that, you do that. We all need caffeine. You're making baba noodles on it. That is an excellent idea. Um, that's true. I think, yeah, I think that's the problem also, and that's something I always think about reading the books in translation. Hang on, let me. Hi. <laughs> uh, and that's also something I think about when I read books in translation too. Is are there is there wordplay? Are there images that work specifically in that language and don't? when they translate. I think it works, um, it can work the other way too though, in that a translator can add in things that can use the steam from the kettle that also wouldn't be there in the original language. So when I um, interviewed um, uh, Deborah Smith, who translates all of Hung Kang's work, we were talking about her book, which is about um, souls, in Seoul, well in Seoul, but I'm saying Seoul, as to, 
show the difference between the soul and the souls. And that, that connection of soul and soul works when it's in English, which has a different meaning. And then also um, she had changed some words in the book because there's one character who speaks in a specific dialect. So then when she translated it into English, she put their um, speech in a Yorkshire dialect to reflect a different... Um, a different way of speaking, but obviously that's very different to the original text. And I just, I find all of that kind of thing fun. You want a quick tea t tutorial? Um, I mean, here is my mug. It's, this is, maybe this is back to front to you. It says J. Boiling water. I've got um, uh, Earl Grey in there, but normally I just drink normal tea, which is in here. Um, but I've got Earl Grey and then I let that stew for three to four minutes and add a bit of milk and that's it. It's not very exciting. <laughs> um, translating slam poetry into Welsh, that's interesting. Yeah, some of my poetry has been translated into Greek and I always wonder what that is like. And with the Franklin books that have been translated, in most languages, the translation doesn't rhyme because they've just translated the words into the other language. And if you made it rhyme that, I mean, it, it, the likelihood is it's not going to rhyme in another language if you're just translating the words as they are. But then I noticed that these Spanish editions of the books, um, the some in Castilian and some in Catalan, they rhyme. So they have changed the text a little bit in order for it to rhyme. And it's really bizarre to know that different versions of your book are out in the world in different languages that say slightly different things. And as someone who likes to be able to control things, that's, um, I think any writer would feel that, like you want to control or have, you know, you, final decision on the text that goes out into the world because it's got your name on it, but you can't do that with translation edition, translated editions. And it's, it's really, really strange. Um, how much of the basil stalks I chopped? Uh, it was a handful of stalks and leaves together. And then I pulled off the leaves and put them to one side. And then I chopped up the stalks. It's not loads. It's really, you can have more than that if you want. I mean, obviously maybe not 10 times that, but I think even up to twice that is really not a problem. Not a problem. Um, exactly, Greg. So Greg's saying that it's interesting with the picture book because obviously the pictures still have to work with the words. So I'm assuming they can't have changed them that much. They can't say, for instance, that Franklin and Luna, if it's if it's saying, like, try and remember my own book, that Franklin and Luna um, love books about um, uh, treasure hunts and pirates um, and uh, acrobats and, and apple pies. Like, so that's some of the things that it mentioned. They can't say, for instance, that they love trampolining, books on trampolining or books about... Um, volcanoes because there are there are no images of that so I assume it must um, adhere to it quite closely um, yeah and exactly with the children's book rhythm is very important so if you're translating it and the rhythm loses something that's also an issue and I've noticed that there are um, in certain editions more words so for instance German there are a lot of words um, compared to the English edition, but it has just been translated. It's just a, it's, it's a wordier language. Um, so the text is a bit smaller, I think, because they had to accommodate that. It just looks quite different and that's really interesting as well. Um, will the second and third Franklin book be translated into German as well? Um, I hope so. That one was, I think, the last one to be translated. So that only came out really recently. And I think with COVID and everything, it's just pushed a lot of things back. So I hope so. Um, the Franklin book, the first one, is out in German right now. Um, and, uh, <laughs> well, that's interesting, Jasmine. You can tell me how different the text is. Right, okay. I'm going to put some milk in this tea.
Okay. Put. There we go. You're very high up now. Um, oh, here we go. Keelan, that's an interesting question. I, oh, hang on, let me put down this blind. It's quite light. Is that better? I think. Um, Is that better? I think that's better. Uh, so Caitlin says, do you have a say if it's published somewhere in translation and they want to send something, like if it was a children's book and you had LGBTQ plus characters, could you say don't publish? Um, I could certainly say don't publish. Um, I have never had that asked me and that actually surprised me because um, The Beginning of the World in the Middle of the Night is published in China um, and nothing like that was um, asked. So I assume that nothing was changed because I would need to be told um, something like that. Um, I think probably it depends on the publisher, but um, I think my publishers would know that I would not be okay with that because we've talked about censorship before. Um, okay, right, let's start cooking. Let's start cooking. Um, so you are gonna need, uh, a pan, <laughs> um, uh, not a huge, huge pan, but I am using a big one. Don't worry if you're using a smaller one because there's not loads of stuff that's going into this. You just need all of the pasta to fit. Let me just get some wire out of the way. So you want to pan on uh, your hob. I realize this is quite dark. It's good, the lighting is gonna change, but okay. So you want to put it on the hob and you want to put the gas on. Oh, this hob, I forget. It doesn't like to work. Put this one on instead. You want to put it on a very low, um, let's say a low to medium heat. Because the thing with the aubergines is that you need to cook them slowly so that they crisp up and it takes about five to 10 minutes. So firstly, pop a bit of olive oil in your pan. I know you can't see inside my fat pan right now, but I will hold it up and show you so that you can see what the aubergine should look like when they are, when they're done. Okay, so you wanna add your sliced aubergine, but not the garlic yet to the pan, just the aubergine. Stir that. And then you wanna add in some salt and pepper. You want to add in the dried oregano. I think I said two teaspoons of oregano. Maybe I said one teaspoon. This is the problem with doing things by eye. I will show you how much I am adding, and then you can just you can add yours. If you want to be really specific, whatever I said on the Word document, which I think was one teaspoon, add that. But otherwise, just you know, tip some in and it'll be fine. And then to stir that all together. And then you just want to cook that, let that cook for five to 10 minutes, stirring it occasionally. While this is cooking, I'm gonna open the passata 
just so that that's ready to go in when we need it. So if yours is like not in a jar, mine are in cartons. If um, yours are more fiddly like that, I would open those now just so that you have them ready. Oh gosh, I nearly panicked there. You say, hi, I'm Greek and I read your poetry book in English. So it would be interesting to see the differences. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I panicked because I thought you said you'd read it in Greek and it hasn't been translated into Greek. It was just for a Greek website and um, the guy who ran it translated, I think, five of my poems. Um, if you search Jen Campbell and the word poetry in Greek, um, and maybe the girl aquarium, then it should come up, I think. How much pasta? Do you mean passata? Which of these? These are ridiculously cute. Ridiculously cute. So I have 600 grams of passata. Each of these is 200 grams. Okay. But I can't get over how cute these are. They're so small. Very sweet. Very sweet. Have we added, sorry, no, we have not added basil stalks yet. No, we haven't. Just the aubergine. So it should be sizzling a little, but not loads. And it should start to brown. You're just kind of drying them out a little bit. That sounds like a really negative thing. You're frying them. That's what you're doing. That sounds better than drying them out, doesn't it? Yeah. Please not judge me, but I'm slightly hungry, so I'm eating a cake. I know this is not part of the recipe, and I'm sorry. Um, I made these last week. These are not, yeah, I made them the first time last week. These are gingerbread cupcakes, and they're amazing. They taste like coming with bakery cupcakes. I think by that I mean that they're quite rich. So I made some again on Friday for Mr. M's mum, and I made these with gluten free flour because um, she's celiac and I was worried it would make the cakes really crumbly because gluten-free flour can, can do that. I once tried to make her gluten-free bread without realizing that the recipe for gluten-free bread is not just the bread recipe but with gluten-free flour and it turned into this ridiculous crumbly uh, rock. Um, yeah, so these are amazing. These are gingerbread cupcakes and they've got a cream cheese frosting um, so I'm going to make these in a reading vlog at some point because I honestly think these are the best cakes ever. And I don't give myself credit for that. I give credit to the person who made the recipe. Um, yeah, delicious. Also, is it just me or does gingerbread make you think of Christmas? It really makes me think of Christmas. Um, and again, it's really warm outside. But the other day when I made them, it was not. And it pleased me. I keep saying things please me greatly, but these definitely please me greatly. So if you have any cake in your hand in your house and you would like a quick cake stop, I won't judge you. So please don't judge me. Ah. How's everybody's aubergine looking? It shouldn't be done yet, but are you finding this okay? It's not catching or anything? It should smell really good as well because of the oregano. Hmm. You've been snacking on Welsh cakes. I mean, oh, I can link the recipe, can't I? Hang on, let me put this down. Because I can type too. I've got ginger cake all over my ass. Let me find the recipe. Hang on. Ginger cupcakes. Okay, this is the recipe. There you go. They are incredible. So 
So what I've noticed with the aubergines that what you do when you cook them is that about, at least about this point for me, they're starting to look quite oily and soft. And that's kind of, it means that it's halfway through. If we put the passata in now, these would end up being really chewy and not nice. Um, so we need to cook them for double the length of time we've already been doing it. You DM me some kitten pictures. Thank you. Let's look at those. I really wish that I turned the camera around because a guy just cycled down the street with a dog in his rucksack and the dog looked like he was loving life. Oh yeah, I was opening these, wasn't I? That's what I was doing before I went and got myself cake. Scissors. These things are not arthritis friendly. I'm glad I started opening these now because it's gonna <laughs> take me ages. One, two. The reason that you want to have your passata ready to go is because in a minute we're going to add the garlic and the basil stalks and the garlic can catch quite quickly so we're going to add it, stir it in for about 30 seconds and then we're going to add the passata straight away. So you want to have it ready because you don't want burnt garlic because that will make the whole thing taste bitter and not very nice. Um, yeah, this teal pot, I think... I remember that Mr. M got it for his 18th birthday, I think. I think he got it for his 18th birthday. And he was the only person who arrived at university with a pot, <laughs> with a pot. But I mean, this is a Le Creuset pot and they're expensive. I think they're about 80 pounds or something, but they are supposed to last you your entire life. Um, and I think they even have a lifetime guarantee. So that was 15 years ago and it's still looking great. So that's good. Um, I 
Okay. I was just checking. I hadn't missed any of your messages. Okay. This is looking good now. Um, I don't know how to show this to you because if I hold you over the pan, I think you'll steam up because it's hot. So let me maybe take a picture and then hold that up so that you can see. I don't think it's ready, but when it looks ready, I'll take a picture and hold it up and show you so that you know what yours is supposed to look like. Steam. So mine are looking like this. They've cooked down quite a lot. They're not looking very oily anymore. So they look a little bit like glistening-y, but at the beginning they looked quite oily. And they've reduced down, as I think I said. So when they're looking like that, put, turn the heat down so it's on low. Because as I said, we don't want the garlic to catch. Or oh, someone says they're more like 140. They've gone up in price then because they didn't used to be that much. Um, okay, grab your basil and your, um, what's this called, garlic, <laughs> and add it to the pan only for 30 seconds and stir it the whole time. And it should smell amazing. I love garlic. I was gonna say if I could marry garlic, I would, but um, I like Mr. M, so I won't. So be careful it doesn't spit at you um, because that will hurt. stir it all together. Now that you've added the passata back in, you can turn up the heat a tiny bit, but you only want it still on um, like low to medium because you don't want it spitting up and hitting you and stuff like that. Um, and if you have AMG, I don't know what that is. We may have that, but I don't know what that is if we do. You want it so that it is simmering lightly. So you just want little bubbles, not anything crazy. I'm glad that you're smiling, Sana. I'm glad. And then you want to add your chili flakes. Now, um, I can't remember exactly how much I said again, because again, I do it by eye. I think I said half a teaspoon 
of dried chili flakes. So add about that. And if you don't like spice, um, then don't add as much. I would recommend adding a little bit, even if you don't like spice, because I think if you added a tiny bit, it wouldn't really make it hot. It would just, um, but it would have some effect on the flavor. So add a tiny bit, even if you're not adding in the whole amount. And um, unless you're doing um, a vegan version of this, because I said you could add in vegan cheese at the, cheese at the end or you can miss out um, on the cheese altogether. Unless you're um, not adding any cheese, we're going to add a little bit of Parmesan to this later. And that makes the heat go down as well. It kind of calms it. So you want that to simmer for about 10 minutes. So whilst it's simmering, I'm going to tidy up my workstation, my workstation and do a little bit of um, washing up just so that it's keeping things tidy, um, which will give you time to do that as well if you want to, or if you're a little bit behind, which is fine, I'll give you time to uh, catch up a bit as well. So. I'll be back in a minute. I'm just going to do some washing up. Thank <laughs> you. 
make sure it's not catching or anything on the bottom of the pan. Um, oh, AMG is a brand for pots with a special bottom. You won't burn anything. Oh, that's really interesting. Oh, hang on. I feel like maybe I have seen those frying pans, maybe. Or else I've just, <laughs> I might have something else in my head. Yeah, because the thing is with the cruise is that, well, one, they're really heavy, which I sometimes find difficult. Um, and two, if you burn them badly, uh, well, that's not great, is it? It's not great. Right. While this is cooking, um, you can grate about a handful of Parmesan cheese if you're using Parmesan cheese. If you're using a different kind of cheese, I don't know if it'll work with vegan cheese because I know that that doesn't melt as well. So maybe don't put the vegan cheese in now. You can just add that at the end later on. Um, but if you're using any other kind of cheese, uh, cheese, I would grate a handful of it now. And if you're confident in your vegan cheese melting into the sauce, then by all means, go ahead um, and grate that too. it but we're not putting it in straight away I just want to have it ready for when we need it at this point that we need to taste test um, and you'll need to decide what you need to add to your sauce or you can add exactly what I'm going to add and that's fine um, or if you think it won't work with the way your sauce tastes because we've all put in probably a slightly different amount of ingredients then feel free to add in or ignore so grab a teaspoon we're going to taste this sauce Mine tastes very spicy. <laughs> tastes very, oh my goodness. <clears throat> that caught the back of my throat. <coughs> it's not that spicy. It just accidentally caught the back of my throat. All right. So I am going to add in a tiny, tiny amount of um, white wine vinegar. Tiny, tiny. For anybody else who's behind, by the way, um, so I know some of you, there's a couple say that you're still doing the aubergines. Once I've finished doing this, I'll quickly list everything you need to do at this stage and you can scribble it down and then you can catch up. Because like, can you rewind lives as they're going or can you only rewind it later? Because obviously if you can go back, then I don't need to do that. But if you can't, then I will, I will tell you. Would apple vinegar work as well? I have no idea. I'm going to say yes. I'm gonna say go for it. Okay, so I'm just gonna put in the tiniest splash and stir that in. And then I'm gonna add in the cheese and stir that in. Until it's melted. Okay. 
and we're going to taste it again. And if it tastes bitter, it's at this point that we can add in a little bit of sugar to counteract that, but if it's not bitter, then we don't need to do that. Uh, oh, you can go backwards. Okay, that's fine. Then I don't have to tell you what to do. Good, great. It's magic, isn't it? Okay, right, let's taste. Mine does taste a tiny bit bitter. So I'm gonna add in I think a teaspoon of sugar. So if you think that yours tastes a bit bitter, then add that into. Just a level teaspoon, so not loads. And then I'm also going to add um, about a teaspoon of tomato puree. This stuff. I'm saying these measure, I mean, I did measure out the uh, sugar, but for everything else, I do kind of eyeball it. As I said, I don't do that with baking because you need to be really precise, but with stuff like this, you can balance it out by giving it a taste. So don't worry too much. The only thing I would really worry about is with the vinegar, because that is a thing that's hard to balance out because it's such a strong flavor. At this point, your sauce should be thickening up. Again, I will take a picture and show, well, I'll take a little video and show you in a second, but let me just taste. Yeah, that tastes really good to me. That tastes done. I'm going to turn off my heat and I will show you what this looks like. Okay. This is what mine looks like. So you can see it's a little bit thicker. Um, so the thickness is important um, just because that indicates that it's cooked quite a while and the flavors have come together. But what is most important is the taste. So just taste it. And when, I think what you're looking for, it's hard to articulate, I suppose, but you don't want one particular flavor to jump out or one particular um, type of taste so you don't want it to be really sweet or, or bitter in the sense that if you taste it and you're like that's really sweet or that's really bitter you don't want anything to be overwhelming you want to feel as though as I said it's come together and um, so you can add in the sugar if you need to you can add in the tomato puree until it tastes nice until it tastes good um, and then you put it to one side turn off the heat and then we are going to uh, do our spaghetti now. I didn't say spaghetti, did I? It's ling linguine? I think it's linguine. Okay, all right. So let me move this stuff away and then I can bring you back over here and we're going to start rolling out our pasta. Um, you said mine is a shocking success thus far. I was reluctant to add sugar, but it helped loads. I'm so glad. I know it sounds really strange to add sugar to something like this, um, but it... It works. Also, you want to wipe down your counter again because we're going to be rolling out pasta. Is it better if actually you just stay there? Is that better? Because then I can talk to you. Would you prefer the camera to be there or would you prefer it to be right here so you can see exactly what I'm doing with my hands? Let me know which you would prefer. Okay. 
Well, guys, I forgot the very last bit. It doesn't matter if you've taken it off already. Stir in your um, basil leaves and they'll just wilt into the sauce and that's fine. Just stir them in. There we go. You like this? Okay, I might bring you guys over closer in a minute. Um, but for now, I'll leave you there. Let me know if you can't see anything properly. Um, just making sure this pan is out of your way. Okay, right. Grab your pasta, your dough. Where is mine? It's behind you. It won't have done anything, it won't have risen. Don't worry, it's not supposed to. It's just supposed to be uh, rested. It needed a rest, okay? It needed a sleep. So, I'm gonna peel it out of the bowl, which might be quite difficult to do. So, don't worry if it sticks. This is the bit that gets really, really messy. Okay. Actually, I think I'm gonna bring you guys over because I don't think, whilst I agree it's nice that I can talk to you and do it, I don't think you're gonna be able to see exactly what I'm doing unless you're closer, so I'm gonna bring you back. If I was using a camera that wasn't my webcam, you might be able to see everything. But given it's just my webcam, I don't think that you can. Okay. There we are. Let's bring you back. And I guess I've just put it down on the counter and now it's stuck to the counter. There we go, right. Okay, yeah, that's better. So, I realized I made this tea and I never drank it. Okay, we're gonna just work with half of the dough to begin with, all right? Just half of it. So tear away half and put the other half to one side. You don't have to be too precise about it. So sticky. <laughs> okay, you go over there. And then we're gonna put a lot of flour on here, right? Okay, and then we're just gonna knead this very roughly just so that it gets completely coated in flour. That's fine. And then you're gonna grab a rolling pin or a bottle of wine if you would prefer, or <laughs> if you just have that to hand. My rolling pin over here. And coat your rolling pin or your wine bottle in flour. And then begin to roll this out. The thing with pasta dough is that it's quite resistant at first to being rolled out. It springs back really quickly. So you just have to keep working it until, see, do, do you see? If I do this and then it shrinks back. So press down firmly. <laughs> And, you know, power on. You want to dominate this pasta dough, okay? You might find it easier instead of rolling back and forth in one, because it might do that, to just keep going in one direction. And what you're gonna try and do is roll it out into a rectangle. And again, you don't need to be very precise about the size. It's more about how thin it becomes. And I will show you, obviously you're seeing this, but I will show you how thin it needs to be so that you get good pasta. But it just takes a while. It's not like rolling out um, a different kind of dough. And I think you just need to um, 
realize that you're going to get completely covered in flour like all of you is. It's kind of a rite of passage. Like this is the thing, if it's sticky, just add more flour to it. That's absolutely fine. You want it to be really dry. Moving that other pasta out of the way. There we go. You want it to be as close to a rectangle as possible. I mean, my corners are still, especially here, quite rounded, but you do want it to be as close to a rectangle as possible, just so that um, like all of the, I was gonna say slices, that's the wrong word, but all the pieces of pasta are of a similar length so that they cook evenly. Again, this is quite a workout. Look at us working out. <laughs> I think I'm nearly there. I'll show you in a second what it looks like with regard to thinness. I have to move this brick in out of the way. Oh well, no, I ripped the bottom bit. If you rip anything, Patch it back together, don't worry. Because you are rolling it very thin, so it is a bit fragile. All right. Here we go. It's huge. It is huge. Um, so when you pick it up, you should be able to kind of see your hands through it. I mean, not, can you see through it already? I don't think you can, because it's not enough light. Like, not in detail, but you should be able to see through it a little bit. Um, actually, that's bad wording, because it implies that I should be able to peer through and see what's on the other side. That's not what I mean. I just mean that you should be able to see your hand quite clearly, like the definition of your hand, if you hold it up, it should be that thin. You shouldn't actually be able to see through to the table I've never been able to roll past that thin before. Okay. Um, just make sure that it's loose on the table so that nothing is sticking. Just kind of assess. Um, put more flour down if you need to. I think mine's okay. Okay. Is that as thin as I could get it? Maybe I'll roll it a tiny bit more. You also want to make sure, of course, that it's of a similar thickness throughout. You don't want to have like really thicker edges or anything like that. All right. Okay, um, do we, yeah, it's not actually, I have to say it's not a Fitbit. 
this is a cheap version of a Fitbit, which cost, I think, £20. I just kind of wanted to keep an eye on my, uh, or hold myself accountable to my step count. So it's made, it made, made me walk around the flat in circles quite a lot. Okay, right. Slurp of tea. Oh, right, we are going to cut this into <laughs> pasta now. So you need a... Um, a sharpish knife, what I mean by that is not a knife you would eat with. You need some kind of chopping knife. It doesn't have to be super sharp, though. It's good if it's a bit sharp because, sorry, I feel like I'm pointing a knife at you, because you want it to cut through quite smoothly. You don't want it to tag on it and tear things. Right. So you are gonna cut this into, I think it's five, I can't remember the exact measurement, but it, that honestly doesn't matter. So for this, I'm gonna cut it into uh, one, two, two, into five long sections it's just it's it doesn't matter how wide they are it's just you don't want to cut it all in one go because it will clump together so i'm doing it it's about i would say five inches um, do i mean that do i have a tape measure i don't want to say like a specific measurement and give you the wrong measurement i do have a tape measure what do i mean do i mean five inches yes i do i mean five inches but you don't have to be precise precise with it so that's about here for me so I'm just going to mark along the top one two three four five there we go right and then you want to cut the first one all the way down careful with your surface mine's very tough like the work surface but if yours scratches be gentle right so you've got this here separate. Now we want to make sure that this is really dry. If you are worried about your pasta dough being a little bit um, wet, what you can do instead of folding it, which is what I'm going to do in a second, you can just con you can just cut individual strands all the way down. It's just harder to do that and get the same length all the way down. It will take you much longer. So what I would recommend is just taking a bit of flour and sprinkling it over the top. It doesn't matter if it's too much flour because it'll just fall off. Like the dough will soak up as much flour as it needs and then the rest will fall off, okay? So I'm gonna do it on both sides. You just wanna make sure that the pasta is really dry. Okay, right. Because when you cook it, the flour is gonna fall off too, right. Okay, so you wanna take the bottom and you're gonna roll it. Don't press it down really tight because you don't want it to stick to each other. You're just folding it really lightly all the way up to the top. And we'll see if my dough was, um, has enough flour on it because if it doesn't, it's gonna stick together. We'll have to find out what will happen. Okay, so you rolled it up, get your knife, and then you're gonna cut this into pasta press down don't like do this and carve down just press like this and remember that the width is going to be like the width of your pasta when it cooks so I would say do it quite thin but if you want really thick pasta then you can cut it thicker Sorry, that's a horrible noise, isn't it? Okay, so there we go. And then, there we go. We've got pasta, look. Wee. It is satisfying. <laughs> oh, sorry, what is five inches in centimeters? That is 12.5, uh, 12.5.
But as I said, it doesn't, it really doesn't matter that much. It's just about breaking it up into manageable pieces. It doesn't matter if those lengths are different lengths across. These should be the same when you cut them individually, but when you're cutting along making segments, it doesn't matter because you're gonna cut them into smaller parts anyway. It's just to make your life easier, that's all. So we call these pasta nests. So each one of these things we're making is a nest. So you want to make sure again, <laughs> there's so much flour, that you cut coat this in flour like this, and then you're just gonna put it to one side. You just wanna make sure that it's got flour on so it doesn't all stick together. Yeah? There we go. And put that to one side and then we do that for the rest of these. Oh, this one's sticking a bit. There we go. Now. I think there's something very, I mean, I know that this is infuriating if it's not working for you. <laughs> okay, I appreciate that. But if it's going okay, there's something I find really therapeutic about this. Oh, sorry, horrible noise. Oh, you don't mind the cutting noises. I'm very glad about that. <laughs> it's, you, you love the cutting noises that makes you hungry. Fair, fair enough, fair. Oh, that one was quite a wide one. I think I might throw that one away. That one went a bit weird. Um, the rest of them are fine. I love that Sana is sending me update pics. I will have a look in a second, Sana, when I am not covered in flour. 
which may be never actually. I feel like this flower may stick to me for the rest of my life. Okay, and then we need to do the other half of the pasta. This is the thing that takes um, the most time. So, okay, um, let's push this up here. And let's look at Sana's pasta before I move on to the second half. Uh, no, Caitlin, I have got the other half is over here. So I'm gonna do the other half in a second. Is Sama's pasta, for anyone wondering? Very nice. 10 points to you, Sana. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna roll out the second half of the dough and do exactly the same thing all over again. If you're able to type, um, well, hang on. I think you can just dry it like sorbet pasta. Uh, can you freeze the dough if you don't use it at all? I actually don't know. I have to Google that one. Um, I think the, re the recipe that I looked at, I think it said that you could put it in the fridge and use the dough, like keep the dough for a few days, but I, it didn't mention freezing, but I'm sure that someone has written about that somewhere. Um, I don't know if you can dry it because the thing with store-bought pasta, I know that Sana's making, um, vegan free, but store-bought pasta doesn't have egg in it. Fresh pasta and dried pasta are very different things. So um, I'm not sure about that. So if anyone knows more about that, you can tell me. But I don't think you could dry this because I think the egg would go bad. And rolling the ribbons is very satisfying. If any of you can type, because I'm sure you've got your hands full of your cooking, but if you can type, let me know how you're getting on. always such hard work at the beginning because it just does not want to be rolled. Come on. Some rolls broke, but that's okay. It definitely is okay. All going to taste the same later, isn't it? So don't worry. 
Um, got any tips for, <laughs> for getting flowers safely off an iPad? Um, well, it depends how much flour you're talking about, but I would have thought a, a very lightly damp cloth would be a good idea. Or just blow on it as much as possible. <laughs> A lint roller for dust, maybe. That's a good shout. I'm sorry if you can hear heavy breathing, but I'm just finding this quite exhausting. <laughs> okay, I think that's about done. Ooh, let's test it. Yep. Looking good. And again, make sure it's not sticking to the table. Ease it off very gently, if it is. Okay, and then cut it into sections. Make sure it's flowered on both sides. See, mine rips a tiny bit too. Let's press it back together if it rips. There we go. And then roll it. Ooh, this one's sticking quite a bit. Okay. 
This one has been a bit of a casualty. Look at that. Look at that. Deary me. Let's heal you. Bring together and pinch. Now for the fun part. Oneness. Is that roller specially coated, getting a fair bit of sticking? No, you just make need to make sure you're using lots of flour. Lots and lots of flour. So I guess this is um it's not a wooden roller, so maybe a wooden roller would be more sticky, but just make sure you're using lots of flour. Make sure that every little bit is unrolled because otherwise it will clump together. See, here's one that hasn't unrolled properly. There we go. Otherwise it will clump together when we cook it.
All right. Make sure that each of these pasta nests, you should have 10. If you've made fewer than that or more, don't worry. Like it's, again, not an exact art. It's just you, you kind of want a handful so that you can add it to the pasta like that. Again, it helps it to not clump. Make sure that each of these nests is um, sufficiently coated in flour because we're going to leave these to sit for about 15 minutes so that they dry out a little bit um, before we cook them and then we'll be done. So make sure they're coated in flour. I mean, when I say dry out, they're not going to look like dried pasta. It's just they're going to be not sticky. Okay. Right, I'm gonna wash my hands and then I'm gonna sit down and talk to you for 15 minutes before we, we cook this stuff. I am so covered in flour, <laughs> can you see? were asking about getting flour off the laptop. I got a bit of flour on my, uh, on an iPad, sorry. I got a bit of flour on my there. And related to pasta. Uh, after your emotional post about summer, I finally jumped into the seasonal quartet. Listened to the first half of autumn in one sitting last night. That makes me so happy. Honestly, I think it's because the world is, this is not going to be hot anymore, is it? Let me put a little bit of um, boiling water in there because the world is especially rubbish right now I think um, that's going to be loud Ali Smith writing about the world is a comfort and has been a comfort for these past four years and getting to the end of that and knowing that she's not writing about the world anymore or at least I'm sure she will be but just not in that capacity I found particularly upsetting so I really hope that you enjoy the quartet. How's everyone getting on with their pasta, by the way? How's it looking? Oh, so it's actually only spaghetti has got, it hasn't got egg in it. Most other kinds do. Really? Let me look at the pasta that I've got in here. What do I have? Let's see, I've got lasagna sheets. What's in this? Uh, semolina and water. No. I'm sure, I had other pasta. Oh, you know, the other pasta that I have, I've put in um, one of these, so it doesn't have the ingredients on anymore. Um, 100%, I know. Okay, while these are drying, do any of you have any questions about books or cooking actually, or, or life, anything? Like let's do a quick, well, a little Q and A while I accidentally cover myself in flour again while we're waiting for this pasta to dry. Um, okay, Greg says, what do you usually do with the eggplant aubergine flesh? Uh, yes, so I said, I sometimes, Sometimes I just put it in the compost, but sometimes I also make baba ganoush. So if you just Google baba ganoush recipe, you can use that to make that if you would like. Um, Caitlin says, this is so great. It's made me take time out from stressing and work. I'm very glad that it has helped. Also, I feel like, like we've been doing this for two hours and 15 minutes and it's not felt like um, two hours and 15 minutes. I don't know about you. Do you know this would work with whole wheat flour as well? I don't know. Um, give it a Google, see what Google says. Um, I would assume that it would, because obviously you can buy like wholemeal pasta, but um, as with the gluten-free flour, sometimes the rules about substitutes are different. So um, check with Google first. Um, I might straight, 
Jump Straight Into Summer by Ali Smith, Will I Miss Out? Um, so previously when people have asked me, actually I'm gonna grab a chair, hang on. Let me grab a chair. There we go, that's much better. So previously, um, until summer had come out, whenever anyone asked me um, if you should read this, the seasonal quartet in order, um, or if you could read them in any order, I had said, you can read them in any order, but I would recommend starting with autumn because they're all great and I would recommend reading them. However, now that summer has um, come out, I would definitely recommend starting with autumn. It's not like the end of the world if you don't, but we have all the characters come back in summer, or at least a lot of them. So Daniel and Elizabeth who are in autumn come back in summer. Iris, Charlotte and Art who are in winter come back in summer. It's hard to work out how you would feel reading summer if you hadn't read the others, because obviously I have. I still think it would be okay. Um, if you read them all in any order, you would eventually get to all of the characters and you would fill in all of their backstories and you would get that warm feeling. You would be able to join dots if you read Summer First and then Autumn. But there's just something in me that thinks that if you read Autumn First, especially because Summer is all about connection and things coming together, the warm fuzzies would be more if you read them in the right order. So you can read Summer without reading the others. If you read it as a standalone, I, I don't think it works as well as the others as a standalone. It's more reliant on the others. Um, so if you just want to read one and you don't want to read all four, I would go for one of the other four rather than summer. If you want to read them all, I would start with autumn. If you're desperate to read summer and you don't really care, then go for it. It's not going to not make sense in the, in the same way like if you read like the third or the rings books before reading the others. It's not going to be confusing like that. I just think the emotional payoff won't be as great, that's all. Um, do you think it'll be hard reading as a non-native speaker? Yes. <laughs> um, Ali Smith and Jeanette Winterson, I think, have many similarities with Virginia Woolf. They're writing about the moment, they're writing about time, and there's lots of wordplay within that. I don't think, again, that it's stuff that would mean you didn't understand. I just think it's, uh, there's a, a lot of layering involved. So the character of Arthur is often called art and there's a lot of commentary on what art and nature and politics, like how they will interact with each other. I just think there would be subtleties that could be missed, um, but that is, um, that's probably the same with, with every book. I think I'm just very hyper aware of it with Ali Smith because I love her style. And the thing that I love most about her books is picking, a, picking apart all of that imagery and all of that wordplay. Um, but you might read it because you love the characters. You might read it because you love the pacing and you, you, that you might love other things. I'm just talking about it from my own point of view. That's all. Uh, so Sana says, what genres are you reading most in this period? I've been reading lots of different things. I think because I set myself the challenge of reading the top shelf. So it's loads of different books. So this month I've been reading a lot of different things and I haven't had the chance to mood read, which is something I would normally do. Next month, I wanna read a lot of creepy books. Um, so that's what I'm feeling a pull towards at the moment. I um, started re-listening to the Frida Klein series for the third time, I know I'm really predictable, but I think when it starts to get to water, water? <laughs> when it gets to autumn and winter, I'm drawn towards crime, horror, creepy. I like those throughout the rest of the year too, but I specifically like them. Also, I'm feeling a pull towards classics, so I might pick up some more classics too. Um, how do I choose what books to take to university with me? I didn't realize how attached I was until now. Um, are you studying English literature? Because if you are, you won't read any of those books <laughs> that you're taking with you unless they're on your course syllabus. Um, I certainly doesn't, didn't. Um, one of the questions that someone asked me for a Q&A recently was, um, how did you read outside of your like university 
um, syllabuses, I didn't really. I mean, I read the occasional book and stuff, but definitely nothing like what I'm reading now. I mean, when I did my um, uh, degree in English, I was reading, I think, between three and four books a week for my courses. And then any other reading I did on top of that was for being a bookseller. So I was reading some new releases because um, we had a policy in the shop that I worked out that we should all be reading what's coming in so that we can recommend properly because that's our job. Um, so I didn't really get to read lots of stuff in the way that I do now. So don't stress about it. If you want to take some for comfort or if you're taking some because English is not the subject that you're studying, then just go ahead and take your favorites, maybe a comfort read um, because the beginning of university can feel quite, you know, it's a whole new thing. It would be nice to have something that you can reliably go back to and love and then just cherry pick a few that you're most excited about, but don't overthink it. It's going to be fine. Um, what is my top favorite book to read during autumn? Um, I'm going to pick more than one. English Animals by Laura Kay, I think is an amazing to read during autumn. Autumn by Ali Smith would be a very good one to read. Um, I think the Frida Klein series would be a great series to start in autumn and then you could read them throughout the autumn and winter months. Um, <laughs> Todd is saying you should take bookcases rather than books. I like that. Um, the Book of Strange Two Things by Michelle Faber, I think, is a great autumn read because it's quite dark. I think it would be quite strange to read that at the moment, actually. And then going into the winter months, his dark materials, I would recommend for winter. Um, someone said, I can't read hardback. It's a bit of a strange thing, but if it's not a paperback, it doesn't work for me. I can understand that. I mean, I suppose portability is not really something that's really important at the moment because we're not walking around a lot. But when that is an issue, then... Um, Sorry, when that is something that we do, getting on trains, traveling places, my God, um, then portability and hardbacks, that, that can be an issue. Also, I know what you mean, it's a tactile, the, the spine, sorry, Sana, the spines don't <laughs> break in the same way. Um, so you can't like fold them over so much. They're a bit more rigid. I mean, they last better, I suppose, um, but I do understand what you mean. You're studying acting, so it involves a fair bit of reading plays. Okay. Um, well, maybe take things with that in mind then, because maybe some of the tasks that you're going to be set are going to be to adapt scenes from novels um, for your course. So if you take things that you think are very visual, things that might work well on stage, then that gives you the option, the option for that. Um, okay. How long have I been sitting here? I think about 10 minutes. Let's start making our pattern, sorry. Sana doesn't like cracking spines. I love it. I am brutal, brutal. Um, okay, uh, I think I've been sitting down about five, 10 minutes-ish. So what you need to do is boil a kettle, okay? Let's boil a kettle. <laughs> And I'm going to put you back over here because we're going to be using the hob again. Okay, I am going to cook these in two batches. 
if you have a really large pan, I think you could cook it all at once, but I'm a little bit, this is always my biggest worry with this recipe, not to transfer my worry onto you. But this is the bit where they could all come together and it could all go wrong. So I think taking the time to do it in two batches is probably worth it. Um, so I'm just going to get not a huge, huge pan. Um, I'm going to So it's not huge at all. And I'm going to put the gas on. Okay. And I'm going to add the boiling water because the kettle has boiled. So I've done it between a half and two thirds up, where you can see, where you can see. And then you need to add a glug of olive oil. This is really important because it means that the pasta shouldn't stick together if you put this in. So a big glug of olive oil and some salt as well. And then we're going to bring this to the boil. Um, what you will need to hand when you're cooking the pasta, well, for after you finish cooking the pasta, you will need a colander or a sieve just so that you've got it ready. Let me get my app. for draining the pasta. And then, I'm just telling you this now so that you are forewarned. When you drain the pasta, what I do immediately is I put a little bit of butter in with the pasta and melt that and stir it around, which again stops it sticking together. If you don't wanna use butter, you can use margarine or you can use a little bit of olive oil. I just run that through straight away after draining it and that means that everything is, you know, separate and nice. Uh, let me put a lid on this actually. There we go. And something else, make sure that your sink is clear and that it isn't full of dishes so that you've got space to drain your pasta so that you're not panicking further down the line. Boiling. There we go. Okay, carefully because you don't want to burn yourself. If you're doing it in halves too, put half of the pasta in one nest at a time. And it should, like, the temperature will obviously go down when you put the pasta in, but that's absolutely fine. Let 
There we go. And I'm going to add a tiny bit more olive oil on top and stir it with a wooden spoon very gently. Only once. You don't want to keep stirring it. You just want to stir it in once. And don't worry if it looks like it's clumping. The olive oil should get between those things and separate out as they cook. That's why we're giving it a gentle little nudge and a stir now to prevent that. See, the more that you stir it, it should look like it's coming loose. There we go. Can you see that? Cool. So now we cook it for insert amount of time here because it will depend. It will be very different for everybody else. So when I first cooked this, I think the recipe that I used said that it would take between three and four minutes. Because if you buy fresh pasta from a shop and you cook it, it does cook really quickly. Um, but I have found when I've cooked it before, it takes about five minutes. It's just a case of tasting it um, at some point and you will know when it's done. I was really worried the first time that I cooked it because I tasted it after three minutes and it tasted disgusting. <laughs> And I thought, I oh, know I have completely ruined it. It tastes gross. I couldn't tell if it was cooked, if it was half cooked or what. And it wasn't until I left it for a few minutes and tasted it again. And it tasted nice because it had actually cooked that I realized that um, it's fine and it just cooks at different, just cooks at a different rate. Everyone's going to cook at a slightly different rate. Um, but it does obviously cook quicker than dried pasta. So we've got to keep an eye on it keep on tasting it a little bit to make sure that we don't overdo it because overdone pasta is a really sad, sad thing. But the temptation is to keep stirring. I have to make myself stir. If anyone has any other questions, by the way, you can type them in while this is cooking and I will answer. But if you don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> Oh, and I probably should have said this before we started cooking, so I'm really sorry if this is a problem for anybody. You need to eat this as soon as it's cooked, just so you know. You can't leave this pasta. It becomes really sad really quickly. Um, yeah, I should have said that earlier. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, you need to eat this relatively quickly. If you reheat it, it's just a bit sad. So, um, yeah, you need to be ready to eat it now. If you're still a bit behind and you're watching this um, and you want to eat it later, you can leave these for a couple of hours and that should be fine and then cook them. Um, how has your cooking journey been so far? What's your favorite recipe? Um, the um, gingerbread cupcakes have been I think probably my favorite cake thing that I've made I've really enjoyed my journey with making meringues um because <laughs> that's just been really fun and experimenting I think I've done like my own recipes with meringues and played around with color in a way that I haven't played around with other recipes so much because I've just been following other people so that's been really fun and making pasta has been super fun as well like I found it really therapeutic very helpful and um, just from from a mind point of view as well as a stomach point of view as well 
Um, where to start with English classics that are maybe a bit easier to understand? I think Jane Eyre is a really great place to start. I would say Jane Austen is also quite easy to understand as well. So those are the two people. Well, Jane Eyre is not a person. She's a fictional person. I would recommend, like, you know, Jane Eyre, I would recommend um, Pride and Prejudice. I would recommend North and South. I think that one is quite easy to get into as well. Yeah. Ooh, car alarm. What are what books am I glad that I read as a child? All of them. I mean, I think something that was formative for me was the Doom Spell trilogy by Cliff McNish. They were like an alternative to the Narnia series that I found before I discovered his Dark Materials because they're for a slightly younger age group. I would say like eleven or so. Um, I really loved the Roald Dahl books as well especially his poetry. Um, and I think just like reading Agatha Christie's and Famous Fives, like, and Jacqueline Wilson's. I think it's, I mean, it's not very exciting answers because this is stuff that lots of people read. Um, oh, Louise Renison discovering her books as well was such a joy. Let's taste this and see what it's tasting like. I'm sorry about this car alarm. You can hear it. Okay, this is how it's looking right now. Can you see? Let's grab a piece. <laughs> Difficult to pick up. Here we go. Come on. Okay, let's taste it. Ooh. Hot, 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 hot. What I like about this pasta is that when you cook it, it becomes quite crinkled. I think it looks quite pretty. Okay. It's not quite done yet though, it's nearly there. This car alarm. Um, I think this will be done in a few more seconds. So you want it obviously to not be hard. You want it to have cooked through evenly so that when you're eating it, there's, there's no bits that feel um, slightly different. Um, it almost tastes a bit buttery. I think because of the oil. You want it to taste nut. You want it to taste like pasta, I guess is just what I'm saying. You want it to taste like pasta, All right? I think that'll be done now because it's been about 30 seconds since I pulled that out. I get really nervous about taking, let's take a little, a, another bit of a little uh, bit because I want to make sure it is cooked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely cooked. Right. I'm going to drain it. I am going to quickly add a little bit of butter to it when it's in the sieve and like shake it so that the butter melts over the pasta just a little bit, just to help it not stick. And then I'm going to add a bit of salt and pepper to the pasta as well once it's drained.
so much steam. There you go. So this is what oops, it's water dripping out. Let me put this here. It looks like this. So it's all loose. And then we have to do that again with the second round of pasta. So I'm just going to let this sit in the sink. So we boil the pasta again. Do you think one of you could go and turn off that uh, car alarm? I would really appreciate it. Okay, Laura says, what are your thoughts on peas pudding? My Geordie in laws love it and I can't even look at it. I never even heard of it until I started going to the Northeast. So peas pudding is peas and you put it, it's like mushy peas almost. I don't know what else is in it actually. I don't like it. I don't like the texture of it. It feels like Play-Doh. <laughs> and you put it in ham sandwiches normally. I am not a fan and I am a native Geordie person. So yeah. Any books you'd recommend to an eight-year-old? I recommend these uh, Katie and Sam Wu books because, no, sorry, Katie and Kevin Sang books, which are the Sam Wu books. I'd recommend those. My nephew loves them and he's seven. Um, what else would I recommend? I would recommend books by Chevelle Pounder. I would recommend, depending on their reading level, because this is like age ranging is difficult. Um, so, like, eight is the bottom end of middle grade really so if they're confident readers I would also recommend um like Anna James books for instance um though they're definitely more complex so it depends on you know where they're at when it comes to reading but those are some of my recommendations um 